intensity to retire to a grove of trees to pray when he was faced with a serious problem. Uh, it seems to me this adds plausibility to his accounts of the first vision. And there are other stories of his retiring to a grove of prey as well. Perhaps, of course, emotional distractions interfered with Joseph Smith's ability to remember a text that he had memorized the night before for dictation to his naive secretaries. Or perhaps personal upheavals distracted him from improvising an original text for them to write down as it occurred to him. And whether it's even remotely plausible to imagine Joseph Smith or anybody else memorizing or composing nearly 5,000 words daily, day after day, week after week, in the production of a lengthy and complex book, is a question that people can ponder for themselves. I might just add that I have uh, I've had a fairly productive two years in terms of writing over the past two years. And I've kept weekly, in fact, daily records of the number of words I've produced. I've averaged just over 3,000 words a week for the past two years of whatever is publishable prose. Uh, some of it has been published and resulted in, so far, at least one very bad book and several articles. Um, <laughs> in any event, that's a fairly good level of productivity. Um, and I'm not working at it full time, but I'm working fairly consistently at it. And uh, we're looking in the, in the uh, production of the book format at a, at a process that's resulting in almost 5,000 words a day for a period of just a little over two months. To me, that's breathtaking. It's really astonishing, especially for a person, a person with Joseph Smith's level of education. Uh, and people who say, well, you know, he just had a great imagination and gushed out of it, need to try it. Uh, books don't gush, at least in my experience. I wish they did. Uh, an anecdote recounted by Martin Harris and Edward Stevenson seems to argue against the translation process being either the simple dictation of a memorized text or the mechanical reading of an ordinary manuscript that it's surreptitiously smuggled into the room. Harris is speaking about the earliest days of the work, before the arrival of all of Calvary when he was serving as scribe. After continued translation, we would become weary and would go down the river in Harmony, Pennsylvania, by the Susquehanna, and exercise by throwing stones out of the river. While so doing on one occasion, I found a stone very much resembling the one used for translating. And on resuming our labor of translation, I put in place the stone that I had found. The prophet remained silent, unusually and intently gazing in the darkness. Much surprised, he exclaimed, Martin, what is the matter? All is as dark as Egypt. My countenance betrayed me, and the prophet asked me why I had done so. I said, to stop the mouths of fools who had told me that the prophet had learned those sentences and was merely repeating them. Furthermore, it's clear from careful analysis of the original manuscript, and I won't go into detail here, but uh, Royal Scouts has published on this, that Joseph did not know in advance what the text was going to say. Chapter breaks and book divisions repeatedly surprised him and had to be added as an afterthought by the scribe. Moreover, there were parts of the text that he did not understand. When he came to proper names he could not pronounce, or long words, recalled his wife Emma, he spelled them out. When Joseph could not pronounce the words of read David Whitmer, he spelled them out letter by letter. E.C. Briggs recalled an 1856 interview with Emma Smith in which she remarked to her husband Joseph's limited education while he was translating the book of Mormon, and she was scribe at the time. He could not pronounce the word Sariah. And one time while translating where it speaks of the walls of Jerusalem, he stopped and said, Emma, did Jerusalem have walls surrounding it? When I informed him it had, he replied, oh, I thought I was deceived. As the Chicago Tribune summarized David Whitman's testimony in 1885, he confirmed Emma's experience. In translating the characters, Smith, who was illiterate and but little versed in biblical lore, was oftentimes compelled to spell the words out, not knowing the correct pronunciation. And Miss Whitmer recalls the fact that at that time, Smith did not even know that Jerusalem was a walled city. In its notice of the death of David Whitmer, and undoubtedly based upon its prior interviews with him, the 24 January 1888 issue of the Chicago Times again alluded to the difficulties Joseph Smith had with the text he was dictating. Smith, being an illiterate, would often stumble over the big words, which the village schoolmaster, Oliver Cowdery, would pronounce for him, and so the work proceeded. Thus, this is my, sum, uh, my summation paragraph on this particular section. Thus we see that Joseph Smith seems to have been reading from something, but that he had no book or manuscript or paper with him. It seems to have been a text that was new and strange to it, and one that required a certain emotional or mental focus before it could be read. All of this is entirely consistent with Joseph Smith's claim that he was deriving the text by revelation through an interpreting device, but it does not seem reconcilable with claims that he had created the text himself earlier, or even that he was reading from a purloined copy of somebody else's manuscript. In order to make the latter theory plausible, 
it's necessary to reject the unanimous testimony of the eyewitnesses in the process. Now that's a limited conclusion, but I think it's an important one that can really be established and sustained. Now the second part of what I want to do here is an analysis of the various hypotheses that have been offered for the production of the Book of Mormon. There seem to me to be eight basic possibilities for explaining the Book of Mormon, which fall into three general classes. I'll summarize the first outline for you. If I'd really been with it, I would have had a nice PowerPoint thing for you to see. I only decided to do this late last night. And, uh, well, anyway. <laughs> I'll offer comments on them then one by one. The first general category is subjective explanations, which has two parts. Either individual hallucination by Joseph Smith or collective hallucination by Joseph Smith, the witnesses, and others. The second general category, objective reality but fraudulent. Uh, first, we have the possibility of individual deceit practiced by Joseph Smith unaided. Second uh, possibility, collective deceit by Joseph Smith, the witnesses, and etc. And the third category, collective deceit by Joseph Smith and some external individual or group. You could divide that, I suppose, collaboration with an external group or exploitation, you know, stealing somebody else's manuscript, borrowing a city, uh, Solomon Spalding's manuscript, or something like that. The third general category, objective reality with supernatural explanations, supernatural quotes, it's a problematic term. You have three possibilities there at least. One is that the Book of Mormon is supernatural but demonic. Um, that's becoming popular in certain rather odd quarters. Um, the second possibility is true scripture but it's not ancient. Or the third possibility that it's simply true scripture, the traditional explanation. Now let's see what implications um, these different possibilities have. At this point in what I'm writing, there will be a, a fairly lengthy, in fact, awfully lengthy, discussion of various kinds of evidence. It's a uh, kind often associated with farms, but other kinds of things as well. Um, first, what I turn to psychological explanations. The, ver the first one in that category is individual hallucination by Joseph Smith. Now, this explanation seems to be virtually impossible to accept. I realize that there are books out fairly fresh on the market talking about the Book of Mormon as an attempt by Joseph Smith to work out his Freudian anxieties and things like that. To me, these things absolutely miss the point. Uh, there are simply too many corroborating witnesses for the Book of Mormon to be taken seriously as the project, uh, product of, of individual hallucination. If Joseph Smith were simply fantasizing in some pathological parallel universe, it's exceedingly difficult to explain the fact that many others claim to have seen the holes in the ground, the stone receptacle, the angles, the plates, the breastplates, the urine, the thumb, the sword, the blade, and all the other things that his holy subjective fantasies called for. Uh, it's very odd that people have seen these things which don't exist. So, we're led necessarily to another possibility, collective hallucination by Joseph Smith, the witnesses, etc. This explanation is only slightly more plausible. It's virtually impossible to imagine that hallucination had continued over weeks, months, and years involving new, numerous people whose hallucinatory illusions were so coherent and congruent with one another. People who, apart from their religious views, unacceptable in principle to certain critics, supply no other reason to think them psychologically maladaptive. I mean, you look at someone like David Whitworth, who goes on in the 50 years he separated from church to be city councilman and then mayor of Richmond, Missouri. Um, Oliver Cowdery leads a pretty successful life as a lawyer, and so on. These people don't seem obviously mad. Um, <laughs> But anyway, I suppose you know, that's, that's what you have to believe. Um, moreover, many of the events that seem to support Joseph Smith's story occurred under wholly matter-of-fact conditions. David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery, for example, climbing onto the hill of Mora, seeing the stone box from which the plates were taken. Emma Smith feeling the plates through that thin muslin cloth, moving them around while she does not housework. Lucy Matt Smith seeing the breastplate. The eight witnesses themselves standing in a clearing of the woods in broad daylight leading to the plates. William Smith estimating their weight at about 60 pounds. Um, Gary Habermas's comment, now uh, there's a deliberate point in quoting Gary Habermas here. He's a very, very prominent evangelical apologist who has written about the, uh, the resurrection of Christ quite persuasively, I might say. Uh, I've had some correspondence with him about some of these issues. Uh, Gary Habermas, but it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how he reacts to his logic being applied to the witnesses. Um, Gary Habermas's comment about Christ's appearance to the 11 apostles is precisely relevant here and worth repeating. Hallucinations are private events observed by one person alone. Two people cannot see the same hallucination, let alone the 11. I'm fond of the fact that in both cases we're talking about the 11. I mean, it's an exact parallel. In support of his position, he cites personal correspondence from someone he describes as a well-published psychologist who writes, 
Hallucinations are individual occurrences by their very nature. Only one person can see a given hallucination at a time. They certainly are not something which can be seen by a group of people. Neither 